Our Town, Dorothy Thompson, speaking to you from the Pippin Room uh, on the UW Richland campus. And you know, almost any time, it could be our last time here. Uh, we're here to bring you the Love of Learning Lecture. is certainly creeping into our lives and uh, many of us don't know much about it. So we have an opportunity to learn about artificial intelligence for the lay person and the speaker is Tricia Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my name is Linda Gentis. And uh, we'll just keep doing as much as we can as long. So first of all, I want to just tell you that we're having an, another Love of Learning lecture on November uh, 13th. It's come, come have a wild twine. And at 6.30, you can come and actually learn how to make twine from local plants in the area. And at 7, there'll be a complete speech about the native plants and what you can do with them. So... And there's, there's more uh, brochures back there if you want to. Okay, welcome to this Love of Learning Lecture series. As you know, this has been a long time series here at the campus to enlighten the public. And as you may have heard, the Richmond campus will be officially closed sometime next year. What that means is still not determined. Therefore, when you leave tonight, Please use your phone flashlight because the lights are out in the area. And um, we're not always not getting along totally with everything, but you know, trying to keep things going. So please be careful of leaving and use your flashlight if you have one on your phone. Okay, so uh, what that really means is not determined, but our administrator and our counselor are still negotiating with the UW system. The latest we heard is that nothing has been settled. And things will remain as it is for the time being, with the UW Platte Bill taking care of the basics. Nothing different. The county has appointed a reconfiguration committee. And if you have any ideas, David Turk is the chair. You should contact David Turk. OK, tonight, though, we have a presentation. So on with education at UW Richmond Campus. Artificial intelligence for the lay person. With complex technology uh, as artificial, uh, I keep trying to say the wrong word here, uh, artificial <laughs> uh, <laughs> intelligence. One does not need to understand how it works, but presently, we hear about it and we want to know how it impacts us as individuals. So we're very lucky tonight. We have Trisha Lewis. She has, a, I have to read her whole long. I can <laughs> go into it myself if you don't want to read it all. All right, yeah. maybe I'll let you do that. Yeah. Anyway, she's well prepared and I love it because she was here at six o'clock with me and she was ready to go. And I will say that Marilyn Peckham and Eric Hoffman who are working here at the campus did help us, even though they're not hired to help us. So it's a community and we're still working hard together. Welcome, Trisha Lewis. I'm gonna turn this mic on, so I might look a little weird bending over to the microphone, but I wanna make sure that everyone can hear me. I do have a pretty loud voice because um, I started my career as a band teacher before I shifted into instructional technology. So if you could, they could hear me over the percussion section, they can hear me. Uh, but my name is Trisha Lewis. I'm the technology integration professional for the Richland School District. I was the new person in the new position. 
the uh, community of Richland Center and the Greater Richland Center um, School area, Richland District area, made a very good choice about seven or eight years ago. They passed a referendum that was our technology referendum. And in that referendum, it's a rolling referendum of about a little under a half a million dollars each year. Not only does that pay for our devices that we use in our building, but it paid for people. And I was one of the people that benefited from this. So we have someone on staff that helps teachers utilize the technology better that we have. We are very lucky in the Richland School District to have such a position. Uh, many school districts are kind of left on their own. They get computers, but they don't know what to do with them. And they might know a little bit what to do with them, but they're not really going to get the return on investment that I might help our teachers to use. In the Richland School District, we're hovering right around our 1,200 student mark in grades PK through 12. We have one-to-one -one devices for every one of our students in kindergarten through 12th grade. We were lucky, I know it doesn't seem like that would be so, but we were lucky in the pandemic. We were ready. When, we were, when it came down the line that we were closing our doors, in three hours we had a device ready to go home with every child that could be connected and still go on with school. Many districts were left scrambling and they just had to kind of fend for themselves. We were lucky, we were ready. Not ready ready, but we were ready. We were ready more than we were knew we were ready. Um, as I said, I started as a band teacher uh, before I shifted into instructional technology. I was a band teacher for about 20 years. I'm now in my 30th year of education and the eighth year at the Richland School District. Uh, Trisha Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, spelled the right way. You might know that name uh, from Oakwood. I'm about fourth, fifth cousin down the line, so I still have to pay for my apples too. <laughs> and uh, I do speaking events uh, not only inside of our district to help our teachers, but I also um, go around not only locally, but around the country. Uh, last weekend I was in Des Moines, Iowa speaking at a uh, educational, uh, educational technology conference for Iowa educators. Three weeks ago, I was on the Google campus in California as a representative from the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I've spoken all over the United States and online as well. So I'm very happy to be with you here this evening. At any time, if you have any questions or if you need me to repeat something or you need me to slow down a little bit because I'm always get, get excited, just let me know. Just say, hey, Trisha. Trisha spelled the right way, by the way, too. Uh, that if you want something repeated, and if you have any questions, please don't just wait to the end. If you have something burning you want to ask or want further clarification, that's what we're here for. We're here to learn, okay? What are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about what is artificial intelligence. So I have a, a kind, of a, kind of a dry explanation, and then I have a fun little video to kind of help you think about it. We're going to talk about how AI is already in your daily life and things you might not think are AI that are AI going on in the background. Things that have been going around for a lot longer that you may even think about. We're going to explore some AI apps and we're going to give a little test to some of these apps and you can see what they do. So get your brains thinking on some creative juices here. And we're going to give these AI generators a test and see what they can do. And then we'll talk about how uh, AI might impact our future, the pros and the cons of AI. Um, I have some thoughts. I have some opinions on AI. It might not be what you think what I, my opinion on AI is. So it'll be great for us to get a conversation going and share our opinions and thoughts and ideas of what we have going on. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. Specific applications of AI include expert systems, natural language processing, speech recognition, and machine vision. Okay, that was a lot of gobbledygook, right? I, too, I admit, it was a lot of kind of, it's a little bit dry. So really, what is AI? Let's take a look at this video and see what is AI and see if you recognize any of the things that might be going on with AI. It's a weekend, and John decided to watch the latest movie recommended by Netflix at his friend's place. 
Before heading out, he asked Siri about the weather and realized it would rain. So he decided to take his Tesla for the long journey and switch to autopilot on the highway. After coming home from the eventful day, he started wondering how technology has made his life easy. He did some research on the internet and found out that Netflix, Siri, and Tesla are all using AI. <coughs> so what is AI? AI, or artificial intelligence, is nothing but making computers based machines think and act like humans. Artificial intelligence is not a new term. John McCarthy, a computer scientist, coined the term artificial intelligence back in 1956. But it took time to evolve as it demanded heavy computing power. Artificial intelligence is not confined to just movie recommendations and virtual assistants. Broadly classifying, there are three types of AI. Artificial narrow intelligence, also called weak AI, is the stage where machines can perform a specific task. Netflix, Siri, chatbots, facial recommendation systems are all examples of artificial narrow intelligence. Next up, we have artificial general intelligence, referred to as an intelligent agent's capacity to comprehend or pick up any intellectual skill that a human can. We are halfway into successfully implementing this space. IBM's Watson Supercomputer and GPT-3 fall under this category. And lastly, artificial superintelligence. It is the stage where machines surpass human intelligence. You might have seen this in movies and imagined how the world would be if machines occupied it. Fascinated by this, John did more research and found out that machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing are all connected with artificial intelligence. Machine learning, a subset of AI, is the process of automating and enhancing how computers learn from their experiences without human help. Machine learning can be used in email spam detection, medical diagnosis, etc. Deep learning can be considered a subset of machine learning. It is a field that is based on learning and improving on its own by examining computer algorithms. While machine learning uses similar concepts, deep learning works with artificial neural networks, which are designed to imitate the human brain. This technology can be applied in face recognition, speech recognition, and many more applications. Natural language processing, popularly known as NLP, can be defined as the ability of machines to learn human language and translate it. Chatbots fall under this category. Artificial intelligence is advancing in every crucial field like healthcare, education, robotics, banking, e-commerce, and the list goes on. Like in healthcare, AI is used to identify diseases, helping healthcare service providers and their patients make better treatment and lifestyle decisions. Coming to the education sector, AI is helping teachers automate grading, organizing, and facilitating parent-guardian conversations. In robotics, AI-powered robots employ real-time updates to detect obstructions in their path and instantaneously design their routes. Artificial intelligence provides advanced data analytics that is transforming banking by reducing fraud and enhancing compliance. With this growing demand for AI, more and more industries are looking for AI engineers who can help them develop intelligent systems and offer them lucrative salaries going north of $120,000. The future of AI looks promising with the AI market expected to reach $190 billion by 2025. So on that note, Okay, I, I, I paused the video right there because it didn't, I didn't go on any further. So thinking about that, when we're thinking about that, how is AI part of our daily lives? So one of the, the first items that I talked about in there was online banking and shopping. How many people utilize online banking in here? Okay, so when you swipe your card, have you ever swiped your card someplace and all of a sudden Shazam lets you know that it thinks it's fraud? Have you ever had that happen? I was at a gas station, a very big popular gas station in Illinois, and I swiped my card to have a little bit of a snack and it would not take it. Of course I was panicked. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm already this far away from home and my card doesn't work? So I called Shazam. It thought it, I was somebody else because I don't usually go to gas stations in Illinois to make purchases. So it just let me know that it thought it was fraud, a fraudulent thing and then I could go back and make the purchase if I needed to. Well, I paid cash, but it was there anyway that we need to do. All of those kind of transactions, that takes place in a millisecond with AI. 
It knows where that card is swiped. It knows what kind of a consumer you are, where you usually do your shopping and everything at, and then it utilizes that technology through Shazam or other uh, places like that. To, it might sense that there's fraudulent uh, activity on your account. Or shopping. Anybody here addicted to Amazon? Maybe a little bit like me? Okay. All right. Have you ever bought something and then two days later you get an email saying, hey, we think you might like X, Y, and Z. Now I can tell when I might be looking up something for my mom and then two days later I get all this recognition of like, why would I want that? Oh, because it noticed that I was looking for all of those things and it's noticed that I would might buy something like that. Um, I recently, uh, in the last year, I have three greats in my life. I have a great niece and two great nephews. I personally don't have any children, but how many emails did I get offering me diapers and pacifiers and onesies and everything else to go along with that? Because I made purchases and it kept reminding me that you might like something like that. Uh, personalized social media feeds. If you're a Facebook person, Twitter, or X as it's known, Instagram. Uh, there's also something called Blue Sky and threads out there. You're scrolling, 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 and you kind of pause and look at something. Have you ever noticed that when you keep scrolling, you see the same thing a couple more times? And when you come back the next day, it might offer you an ad about what you were looking for. And it might say, hey, we saw you like this. You should like this post or you should like this company. All of those personalized things, anything that you can think that's personalized, AI is working in the background to take what you do and give you something else that might take you to what you might like as well. Is it always right? No, not necessarily, but it starts to learn if it's right or not because you could say, no, that I don't like that, no, that I don't like that, and those will leave from your feed and then something else will come in your feed. So you can have that in there. Video recommendations, same kind of a thing. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Paramount, uh, Peacock, wherever that you get your online videos from, any kind of online entertainment, when you start to watch things, it notices what you watch. And you know what? It doesn't just notice what you watch, it notices when you watch it. So if I turn on Netflix in the middle of the day, it might offer me certain types of movies to watch, maybe a lighthearted rom-com or something like that. But when I turn on at night, it might give me a serious drama or maybe a horror movie because those are the times that I tend to watch those movies or shows. So it's not just noticing what I like, but at what time I'm liking to watch that kind of stuff. So all of those recommendations go in there. Believe it or not, 80% of Netflix traffic is what's based on recommendations, not what people actually just look up and put into their queue. Every time you like something or dislike something, Netflix is learning about you if you like that and giving you those recommendations. Uh, face recognition. iPhone users in here? Okay. If I pick up my iPhone to do uh, facial recognition, it lights up my face because I've always wondered how that works. In the middle of the night, I can pick up my phone and with my eyes open, because you've got to have your eyes open, otherwise it will not fa do facial recognition then. It actually places 30,000 individual little dots on my face to look and see if, I, if it thinks I am who I am. Now, if you ever looked at my sister or looked at my mom, we look very much alike. But if we hold our phones up to each other, they do not open. It does not recognize that. Now, way back when photo ID kind of came up, like uh, identifying people in photos, it would keep saying, are you Rachel Lewis? Is this Rachel Lewis? No, I'm Trisha Lewis. But it thought I was at my, my sister. I don't get that as much anymore. It's starting to learn. All the time that you're, that you're identifying those things, saying yes or no, you're helping that machine learn. So 30,000 points come on there. It does that scan. 
matches it to the scan that I put in the phone to make sure I am who I am. I'm always enthralled that when I pick up my phone and I have sunglasses on, or I wear glasses sometimes when I'm driving at night, especially for faraway distances. I don't usually need them for anything else, but just for those faraway distances, that this still recognizes who I am. If I have a cap on, and I might have a kind of weird, like maybe expression if I'm kind of squinting and you know, all that kind of stuff, not so much. You might have to take, you know, open up your eyes more so it gets all those points to do that basic facial recognition. All of that is AI, it's learning in the background. Predictive text and autocorrect. Ugh, autocorrect. Okay, it types the word that you think you want to type. Uh, not always, right? It, it might suggest something. But by you saying no, and you keep typing in what you think, it's going to go in there. In our email program, we use Office 365 for our email at the school district. I can be starting to compose an email and it starts to finish my sentences. Because it knows, it thinks it knows what I'm going to type. And I'm going to tell you what, it knows what I'm going to type. And all I have to do is tap that tab key and it puts all that text in there and it finishes that email for me. When I go to send off that email, I might have talked about, hey, take a look at this and tell me what you think about it. I didn't say, look at the attachment. I said, hey, take a look at this. And before, when I get sent, it'll say, are you sure you want to send this? Do you want to put an attachment onto this email? <coughs> It's starting to learn. It knows what that email is saying in there, and it's asking for that in there. Um, you know, misspelled words. Uh, Apple sometimes has a little bit of a um, mm, curse word detector. If you try to start to type F, you, uh, it doesn't like that. It thinks you should be nicer than that. It will give you a different word to put in there. Uh, you really have to tell your iPhone if you really want to do that. Sometimes. I want to say that to my iPhone, but I don't. Uh, but it has those kind of detectors in there. In our um, learning management system uh, at school, we have a list of about, oh gosh, you wouldn't believe it, probably about 5,000 words that we put in and every spelling of what you think one of those naughty words might be. And if the kids try to type those naughty words, it automatically puts asterisks on their screens and it doesn't allow them to type those naughty words. So it's all learning. And you know, if they come up with some new word, we put that in there as well and have that in there. Uh, how else is AI part of our daily lives? GPS maps and routing. All right, you're going down the road, you've got your map going, it's telling you to turn at a certain place. And all of a sudden it might say, Rerouting. Have you ever heard rerouting? So it's going to take a look at traffic in the area. It might also use weather in the area. If it notices that there's severe weather, heavy rain, where there might be flooding on the roads, it is going to route you around that. Uh, if you are looking at Google Maps and you see those red lines on the road, it knows by the number of cars on the road that maybe this is a little bit too heavy. So instead of taking I-90, maybe you want to take Highway 14 across Minnesota instead of I-90. A little bit slower to go through those towns, but you actually might make up the time. So it uses all that technology in there. Uh, digital assistants like Siri and Alexa, I don't know if I should say those names too loud, especially her. She likes to be, you know, if I say, hey Siri, oh, she woke up. Um, so you can talk to your, your uh, uh, assistants here. The co-pilots in our life. Sometimes I find myself using them a little bit more than I do at other times. Sometimes it surprises me. I have an Amazon Alexa in my house. I changed the word to Echo because I used to like a show where the name, main character, her name was Alexa. So every time somebody said Alexa, my thing went Whoop, and it was listening to see what I might say. But even the name Echo, it kind of catches up in there. So when you are using all of those technologies, it's learning all the time. Learning all the time what goes in there. Chat bots work along the same way. Um, have you ever been on a website and down in the corner there might be a little, little quote bubble and it says, I'm here to help. And you start typing in questions and answers. 
That's not a real person. That's a chatbot. It might eventually get you to a real person if you keep asking the right questions or demand that you talk to a real person, but most likely just a chatbot in there. And smart devices, uh, everything from your Nest thermostats, learning what time of day and what temperature you like it on a certain time of year, to refrigerators who, who know what kind of ingredients you have inside that can automatically make shopping lists for you on your phone to what you need to shop for and put into your refrigerator. All those smart devices are learning, learning, learning. Have you ever used any of these in the background? Are you surprised that all of this is AI in the background? Uh, things especially like predictive text and autocorrect, things that have been around for a long time. Autocorrect, when you first started getting cell phones, it's been around for a long time. All AI in the background. Okay, so what is it like? So I got a few AI apps here that we're gonna have a little bit of fun with here. Um, I have some uh, Quick Draw from Google and Auto Draw. I gotta make sure I put the link in there for later on. Uh, if you've heard of Chat GPT, Google's brand of Chat GPT is called Google Bard, like the Bard of Avon, like Shakespeare. Um, we're going to use something called Music LM. It's from, you notice a lot of these things are Google. Google has invested billions and billions and billions of dollars into AI. And so they're developing all these things. Uh, we're going to create music from AI. We're going to generate some images from AI. And I'll show you how AI can be used like on a smartphone to be able to identify things. So let's first try Quick Draw. So Quick Draw is, is using the neural network. And what's going to happen here is that a, an image is going to come up on the screen and, or not an image, a name is, a word is going to come up on the screen and I'm going to try to draw it. Don't laugh at me for my drawing because I'll call you up here to try it next. <laughs> um, and it's going to see if it can guess what I'm trying to draw. It does not know what it's telling me to draw. It's going to see if it can guess. And there's about six of them in here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I got my pen working, yep. And I'm gonna say, let's draw. Oh gosh. I see circle, or balloon, or person. I'm stung. I see yoga, or kangaroo, or mermaid, or bracelet. I see the Mona Lisa, or long hair, or hula hoop. I see satellite, or angel. I see panda. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. Okay, I'll show you what happens at the end. I see circle, or moon, or blueberry, or planet. I see donut, or heart. Oh, I know, it's B. <laughs> I see nose, I see lead, or golf club, or saxophone. I have no clue what you're drawing. I see smoke, or banana, or seahorse. I see shrimp. Oh, I know, it's telephone. I see circle, or clock, or baseball. Oh, I know, it's basketball. I see elbow, or marker, or suitcase. Oh, I know, it's crown. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I practiced on this. I never got any of these words before. So just so you know, it's not like I'm cheating here, okay? Okay, let's see. I see moon, or circle, or apple, or spoon. I see stethoscope, or clarinet, or foot, or asparagus. I see baseball bat, or screwdriver, or cherry. I see green bean. I see microphone, or golf club, or saxophone, or cannon. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. Wow. Okay, so our neural net figured out four of your doodles, but it saw something else in the other two. Select one to see what it draw, drew, but I'm going to go to one that it already did. And so I'm going in here, and then see how it also thought of my different things. Now here are drawings from many other people who have played the game. And it guessed that it was a B from all these different drawings. How cool is that, right? That is very cool. 
I want to show you a little bit of a riff on there. That's called Quick Draw. Fun game to play, by the way. Really fun to do on your phone. Doesn't cost anything. Don't have to sign in. Just play. Right, I'm going to go into the Auto Draw feature. All right, so this is just Auto Draw. Uh, if you are drawing something and you don't know uh, how exactly how to draw it, Google can help you out. All right. Uh, something simple I could draw. Somebody name something out here. A whistle. A whistle. Oh gosh, a whistle. Let's see. Okay, I'll go like this. Maybe like this. Notice what's going on across the top. It's suggesting things that I might have, are going in here. Hmm, whistle's a little bit harder for me. Let's try. Um, let me do, let me undo. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a cat. I'll try a cat. All right. So we know cat. How about this? Okay. It sees a moon. It sees a pizza. If I put some ears on. Okay. Look how that that changed up there. I'm going to put a little eye, I'm going to put a little mouth. Oh, look how it's changing again up there. Especially if I go like this, and I actually meant this, and guess what? It draws it for me. Mm -hmm. So now I could take this and download this image and use it wherever I wanted to. So if you're not a very good drawer, it can do the drawing for you. And notice it had several different cats up here. And you could change the color and do everything that you want to. Another thing, really fun to do. By the way, um, this link here is on my website. I have my business card up here. The slide deck that I'm sharing tonight and all of these links are right here for you so that you can take them home and try them out and share them yourselves with your friends and family. Let's take a look at chat GPT. Okay, here we go. All right, Judy, give me something. Be creative. What would you like to know? Um, uh, I would like to know about um, the University of Barcelona's history. How about we say, in three paragraphs, tell me about the history of the University of Barcelona. And I did not plant Judy, and she's not getting paid for this. Okay? I'm going to, I type that in. Okay? And notice on the side that I can say yay or nay. That helps the machine learn. And I can also copy it and put it into a document and print it out and say, oh, look, I did all this research on the University of Barcelona. Did I really do all that research? Did I just know how to ask the right question? Okay. Let's see. How about, here's where I'm going to let my bias come in a little bit. I'll say useful. I typed in, I typed in, design a math lesson plan for grade four students focusing on algebra. I'm scared of chat GPT. I'm scared administrators will find out it's about chat GPT because why would they ever pay for a prep period when I can type in one sentence and I have my lesson plans done? How about... Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Oh, good. Um, how do we know about the quality of that lesson plan or whether it would be suitable for rural students as opposed to urban students? So this is where they're saying that the teacher is going to make the difference, that the teacher is going to take that and think about the class that they have and think about the students 
the socioeconomic climate of the school students, where they're at, okay? The teacher's supposed to do that. Do you know how hard it is to find teachers nowadays? Will the teacher do that? Will that just be, oh, here's, here's, our, here's our assignment, here's my lesson plan. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it seems tailor-made for individualization then, that you, the system looks at how this student is responding to these particular questions, and it shouldn't take very long to figure out all of those other things about, uh, you know, previous educational experiences and socioeconomics and all of the other sure. factors that a teacher sure. hopefully would learn over dealing with a student over a period of time. Yeah, and, um, and that's where the good teacher comes in. And, and maybe this is just a guide to help that, you know, to put that in there. Yes? Okay, now, you're showing us just some particular apps, right? I'm just showing you Chat GPT. Yes, these are some okay. of the of some AI apps that I thought would just kind of be kind of wowza, kind of get the idea of what AI is all about. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is just something that's out there. This is Chat GPT 3.5. This goes back to knowledge of 2021. I don't pay for the knowledge to get on that it can go retrieve from the web. You can pay for that and it gets you knowledge of today. This is getting knowledge up till 2021. Anything posted, books, thoughts, all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna go here first and then back to you. So I'm a family physician and I, this is where this is gonna be very helpful. And this is an example of where the individual physician will be important in interpreting something like that because uh, maybe I didn't have enough coffee, maybe I didn't go to enough courses, but if I type in enough things, it will give me all the possibilities and if some of the possibilities are for a patient in Africa, I can get rid of those. Yes. And then I can make sure that I um, enter in what is the most common in this area here to hone it better and therefore um, make my time much more efficient. Yes. But it takes that individual to work with it. Yes, absolutely. And then it's going to learn from how you type in for the next person to type in. And then it learns from how that person typed in for the next person to type in. So that's where the power of it comes in. Go ahead. So I'm very new to all of this, but I observed that there are art programs yes. where you can say, okay, give me this in the style of We are going to, we're going to show one. I'm going to show okay. one later. Yep, I'm going to show and, one later. And I just wondered if that took not only a different program, but a lot more horsepower. Uh, I'm going to just do it right here in my browser. I'll show you. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, I put up here, design four healthy snacks that use three ingredients or less. How about, here's, here's where it gets interesting. Can you speak as you've Yeah, I'll, let, me, let me finish it up, yep, yep. Write a paragraph as a fourth grade student with grammar and spelling errors about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> he was the 16th president. He was a tall man with a cool hat and a beard. He did the Gettysburg Address and helped to free the slaves during the Civil War. He was a good man and everyone liked him. Does that sound about like a fourth grader about what they talk about? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one more prompt here. <laughs> Create a three paragraph story about Trisha and the characters from Sesame Street.
Once, once upon a time, on a sunny day on Sesame Street, Trisha, a bright-eyed and curious little girl, found herself in the colorful world of her favorite TV show. She had just met her childhood friends, Elmo, Big Bird, and Cookie Monster, and she was brimming with excitement. Can you believe that? Now, Google Bard does exactly kind of like the same thing. It's just Google's flavor of it. So let me go ahead and type another prompt in. I just designed a few just in case. Does anybody have one that they want to put in? Have an idea? Go ahead. This is jumping ahead, but what if you ask it something like, how soon before AI totally destroys humanity? <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, BARD is a little bit different. It actually searches the internet. However, I'm not able to predict the future, so I cannot tell you when artificial intelligence will destroy humanity. However, I can share some information about artificial intelligence. And look, it cited it, where it found the information from. That's the difference between Chad GPT and BARD. Um, how about we create some music with AI? So I got on a little bit of a test run with Google here. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, music that sounds like Mozart. Um, It refused to respond. It didn't know. It didn't know how to get it the right way. It's all, you know what, I find this in my job too. It's all in how you ask the question. Yeah. You know, people don't understand something about technology. You don't have the language to ask the question in order how to fix it. If you have the language in order how to ask the right question, you're going to get a certain answer. So, of course, think about that a little bit. There's a little bit of bias in how questions are put in and what kind of information is in because I am a 51-year-old teacher from Southwest Wisconsin. How does my bias of how I grew up go into my question asking and what I'm looking for for information versus being a 51-year-old teacher from Central LA or a 51-year-old teacher from the Netherlands? You know? Isn't that how it works with people? Exactly. <laughs> it's all how you ask a question. Let's and see. I don't understand that question that you asked. So oh, I don't blame. You know, I yeah, I'm trying to see if I can cite. Right, how about um, jazz music with the flair of Charlie Parker? Ooh. Oh, didn't like that either. Um, let's see. Uh, short jazz piece that is peppy. It's going. Not only did it give me one result, but it gave me two. And I'm supposed to let it know which one I like better by giving it a trophy. So that first one was... Versus two. by show of fingers, one or two. two. Okay, all right. I'm going to give the trophy to one this time. I could actually take that and download it because guess what? That is original music. Oh, that was my question. In fact, if you listen to my podcast, my little podcast intro. I got the music from this. I just said I wanted a little ditty about something, I don't know, kind of jazzy, it sounded like a vibraphone or something in there, and it just gave me that. I downloaded it, I put it into my, my podcast every week, and that's my jingle. And I'm a musician. Ooh, this is
this is kind of scary, right back here. How about if you ask it to write out the music? Oh, um, if you ask, like if you go into uh, chat, GPT, or Bard, it'll give you chord structures, the, uh, but it won't the, give you notes, notes. Of the tune you just created. Yeah, it'll give you the chord structures because I've tried that. Oh. Um, it'll also do, how about this? Um, at least two verses and a chorus. <laughs> Read that for people in the back. Okay. It's, I asked it to write lyrics for a song about a pig that lives on a farm at, with at least, I've got to put with, with at least two verses and a chorus. Down on the farm, there's a pig so sweet with curly pink tail and four little feet. Rolling in the mud, oh what a treat. Our piggy's got a rhythm, a heart that beats. Oink, oink, little piggy in the sun. Run, run, it's time for piggy fun. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. If you took that, could you put that to music? Absolutely. I don't know what program does that, but I almost kind of sung it, didn't I? Oink, oink, little piggy run, 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 it's time for piggy fun. Starting, playing, dog days must be begun. On this farm, you're the only one. <laughs> so there's other prompts that you could do this in. You could say it in the style of, of, of a drunk person. You could say it in the style of a whatever, of a three-year-old talking and make it rhyme. I could say, uh, give me a haiku. About apples. Crisp fruit on the branch, autumn's gift in shades of red, apples sweet embrace. Which program are you in again? I am in Chat GPT. Yep. Uh, one other one I want to show you is that image generator, <coughs> the artwork here. This is Doll E, it's an image generator. Uh, it has, it gives me an idea, so I'm going to go ahead and just use the idea that it has here. An impressionist oil painting of a field of sunflowers. It's working. It's working. These are my other results on the side. So I could edit on that if I wanted to. I could download it. I could put it somewhere else. So if I was looking for that perfect image for a presentation I was doing, I could find that perfect image without even taking it or making it myself. I think this one I put in a cute purple monster that's eating an apple. A painting in the Renaissance era of a teddy bear. <laughs> Judy. It, it's your image, you own that image. I own that image. I own that image. So there goes copyright. There goes copyright. Copyright is gone. Copyright is gone. One last one I want to show you here. Um, could you turn the lights back on? I think I need a little bit more light in here. I have my phone going here, and I'm going to do one on my phone just because it's going to use the camera. And it's called... Uh, thing, a translator for things. So I'm going to, I'm going to put my camera over this pen on the desk, and I'm going to take a picture of it. Okay, so it first saw gray, and not only did it see the color gray, but it gave it to me in Spanish. So I can go and I can change the language, and I'm going to try again. If I go closer. I promise this works too. It looks like it's not working right now. But I take pictures around. Let me try this. Oh, I thought that was wood. That's interesting. Oh, but down at the bottom, it's you can't see this. Let me get this out of the way here. 
Um, on the bottom of my screen, it actually says, it also thought it was a writing implement. 80%, 87% thought it was a writing implement. I'm gonna try this. When I took a picture of my mouse in my office, it thought it was a gadget. That's what it came up as. Oh, font. Oh, oh, font, because it read underneath. An apple underneath. So those are all AI apps. That just a smattering of them because our time was you know, kind of short. I didn't want to totally like make your minds like blow up all over this place. Um, when I was prepping for this, I just couldn't help but like wonder about it and think about how does this turn the future. So we kind of started talking about it already. What do you think are some pros? What about some cons in using AI? Anybody got any ideas now that you've kind of looked at it? Yes. Well, let me make a suggestion. Yes. In the last month or so, there's a, in fact more than that, there's been a writer's strike in Hollywood. And they are very concerned about AI and how it will affect their jobs and how that can, you know, they, they imitate their work and they lose the copyright and any rights to it. So they got machinery doing the work of humans who are being underpaid anyways. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem. Mm -hmm. so. so a con, right? If I pulled up uh, our chat GPT, uh, write a script for a Hollywood blockbuster about a tornado that hits South Dakota in the middle of winter. Not likely. Winter Fury is a gripping Hollywood blockbuster that combines the action of a tornado disaster film with the resilience and unity of a small town community. It explores the themes of survival, leadership, and the strength that can be found in the face of unimaginable challenges. With breath breathtaking special effects and a diverse ensemble cast, this film promises to keep audiences on the edge of their seats while celebrating the human spirit. Now, I could have sat for three hours and not came up with that paragraph. Creative writing class is 101. The students don't have to write anything. They just punch a button. So, very good thought. Well, it's scary for a Now, there are AI detectors out there. But they don't work very well. I took something that I created in ChatGPT, pasted it into a Google Doc, and used an AI detector. And it told me that it was 97% original. OK? But there are little other tricks that teachers can do. I, I have some tricks that I can show them on a Google Doc, especially if students are using Google Docs um, to do their, their writing on. You can look at version history. And if a student all of a sudden pastes in five pages in 10 seconds, there's no way that they typed that or spoke that in. So that's copy and pasting. That's plagiarism. Doesn't even matter what it is. I don't care what the content is. I know you can't type that fast. I know. And how did you get to there? Because uh, they they can share their they share their Google Docs with the teacher so oh, that they okay. grade them. It'd be like it'd be like getting a piece of paper. You know, could they could they take that five page paper that Chad GPT and then retype it in? Yes, but are students that motivated? <laughs> no, nope, they're copying, and pasting, and thinking that they're getting one by. It doesn't show the revision history. It doesn't show how, how they came about on the process. And it isn't so much that the teacher wants to play gotcha. It's just we would like them to learn to write. Exactly. Exactly. Because then they learn to think. Exactly. Or vice versa. And it's, it's frightening to think that the new intelligence will be, you know, doing a little search on Google, mm -hmm. typing something in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the other hand, a really nice, and I think this would be a program that would be machine learning, is Merlin, which is an application, a birding application. Sure. And um, it's been around, the, 
It's got a really neat uh, listen feature, and you turn on the app, and if and if you push the listen, it listens to the birds that it's hearing, and it will tell you what it's hearing. For uh, beginner birders, or even I've been birding for years, but sometimes I'm perplexed, and it's a great tool. And in the two years I've been using it, it has gotten better. Of course, because of course, it used to be quite unreliable. And it's interesting because really top-notch birders who don't get stumped, they are very elitist about it and they don't like it. Because they earned it the old-fashioned way. Sure. They climbed sure. the mountain. Sure. And we took the cable car out. Yeah. So, um, it's interesting. Can I catch the lights? Let me catch the lights one more time for a minute because I want to show you something that's in that same vein. I have some pictures of some flowers that are here in my iPhone. Uh, do the reverse. There we go. Okay. Uh, these are all pictures that I took or my mom took for me. So I'm going to tap on this picture right here. Now keep it to yourself if you think you know what those, pic those, those flowers are, right? Now down at the bottom of my screen, I have a, a little eye with some sparkles beside it. If I touch that, look what it told me. Can you read it? It says, look up pansy. And I can touch on that, and it gives me the knowledge and similar web images that it found that match that image. So I could go on and find the, um, the genus and the species of that pansy. And it's, see, it's kind of like glowing around because it's searching that image. I can do another one. Okay, cool picture, right? I'm going to go to that. And it's telling me that it is the common sunflower. Species of flowering plant in the family of, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Okay. And then it gives me similar images. Now that is a picture that I took of a sunflower that was at my mom and dad's house. And look, my phone knew, not only that, okay, it gives me the information about the uh, picture, but uh, guess what? It shows me where I took that picture at. It knows what time of day and all that kind of stuff that I took that picture. It could start to group pictures like that together and make me a photo album of flowers all put together. That's all built in to the computer that's in our pockets, you know, that we have that is a full-fledged computer in there. Uh, other things that I want you to kind of think about, about the pros and cons, uh, what if some of this stuff was automized, autom you know, automized for doing? Oh, it's a disco. It's a disco. Disco. There. Okay. Um, so it could save some work, but could it put people out of work? It's always been true. Yeah. Anything. And to just industrial revolution, absolutely. Um, can it think faster than any of us can? Yeah. Is it always right? No. Could there be data privacy concerns that we might have to think about with this? Now, it's the, like the chat GPT, that 3.5, it doesn't know like current information, like I can't ask it what tomorrow's date is. Well, actually I could because it knows today's the 23rd and it would tell me tomorrow. Um, I asked it a question earlier. Uh, I was born on March 17, 1972. What day of the week was I born? Friday, it told me. And then it told me how I could look it up on the web if I didn't want to ask it that question. So, but I told it that I was born on March 17, 1972. But it doesn't know me as me. Or does it? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's all sorts of things in there that it's gonna, it can impact our future. It's impacting our daily lives right now, like you talked about the writer's strike. I thought about that. You know, I thought about also how many people kept working and wanting to work through the pandemic and trying to make things work and work and work and work. And now all of a sudden we have strike, 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 strike. Auto workers, actors, screenwriters, everybody that tried to keep their job going through, through a pandemic, but now 
They want more on the other end of it because they went through that. Uh, how many of those jobs might not be replaced? Because they found in that time, all these machines have learned better how to do something. Oh, we don't need all 100 of you. We just take five of you. The five of you that know how to program this machine. And it goes in there. Question, comment? Question about um, the data privacy. So the ID, the ID app that you just used to show the flowers, to identify the flowers, can you use them, can you restrict what they're collecting, such as turn off location in that app? Because that's an identifier and of different things in your, as a person, as well as how you move around. So that's built into the iPhone. That's not even a special app. That's just photos on the iPhone. If I take a picture, if I have location services turned on, which most likely I do because of the other perks of getting location services, I could turn off location services in my photo because if I send that photo to somewhere else, and then they send it somewhere else, and then they send it somewhere else, they know right where I took that picture at because that location data is embedded in that picture. And, and some apps will allow you to use them if, if your location is turned off. Oh, absolutely. But they yeah. always scare you a little bit and say, all the functions won't work in your phone if you do this, and then you think, well, should I or not? Yes. And so, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah there's, there are ways to turn things off, but then again, you might not be able to use what you want to use because it demands that it knows your location. And does Apple allow you to go app by app and disable? Absolutely, uh, yes. Yeah. I, in fact, today, we just were setting, I mean, it's interesting how things happen. We were setting up a, uh, an app for a student of a little device. Um, how many people like have a tile or an Apple AirTag on their keys to help you find them or whatever? Well, this is a thing that actually can clip on a student, uh, a special ed student, because they, they were running away. And not only did they run up in the building, but they ran out of the building. And they kind of got to the highway, and it could be bad. So we found this thing that we're going to be able to clip to the student, and when they get too, too far away from the teacher, it beeps. You know, if you're in a classroom and your head is turned, and a kid walks out the door, especially someone that does. But anyway, all the location services, all the things that we had to set up. Now, we didn't use any name on this app. We called this, we called the student, we just call it the student in the app. So it doesn't know how old this kid is or whatever, but it knows it's somebody or something that we're tracking at one of our schools. So we kind of have to be careful about what we're doing but yet the benefit of the location services, we even when the student goes outside to the recess area, if they get too far away from the teacher, it starts to beep. You know, if somebody's helping, a teacher bends over to help a kid tie their shoes, that kid could be 100 feet away in, you know, a few seconds. And it beep, 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 beep. Because of the technology that's built into it. Just really interesting how things go like that. Um, I have a little sign in my office that says, just because you know how things work doesn't mean it's not magic anyhow. To me, I'm a techie. I'm a geek. I, I live and breathe this stuff every day. And I still don't understand it. I'm still learning every single day. Because it's always changing every single day. Look at you. You're all learning. You are one step better than you were an hour ago. Believe it or not, an hour ago. That went by fast then you are in here, you already know more. Does it mean that it's going to be the same tomorrow? Probably not. But we're all learning and we're all working together to make, keep our minds going and learning about this. over the years to help support the campus and are commemorated here. Hmm, I wonder what will happen to their memory. Uh, well, we'd like to wish you a happy Halloween if you celebrate the holiday, and we hope you'll come back next week and every week to watch Our Town.